This program is brought to you by Emory University. Welcome, everybody, uh, to our Bellows Conference, first one of the 2022 calendar year. Uh, you can see our speaker this morning is Jason. So Jason is a third year fellow, uh, first year clinical fellow for those that don't know him in our, uh, clinical research track. Uh, he did research with Jonathan Kim in sports cardiology. Uh, he, uh, did his undergraduate studies at USC Southern Cal, uh, did, uh, med school, excuse me, residency at Cedars, sorry, med school at USC and residency at Cedar sinai And he's gonna to talk to us today, as you can see, about anomalous coronary arteries in athletes. So looking forward to it, Jason. Great, thanks for the, um, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Williams. So um, yes, today I'll be talking about anomalous coronaries in athletes. Um, now this wasn't exactly my area of research, but I managed to keep it in that athlete area. So no disclosures. Um, here are our learning objectives. Um, so first, I'm going to define uh, what exactly constitutes a uh, coronary anomaly in current day, I guess in the current era. And the focus of this talk will be specifically on anomalous aortic origins of the coronary arteries. So when I refer to coronary anomalies from here on out, I'll um, specifically be referring um, to anomalous left off the right and anomalous right off the left. Um, <clears throat> Next, I'll be going over um, the relevance of these anomalies, um, specifically with regard to sudden cardiac death in young people. And all of these, most all of these studies have been done in athletes. So generally speaking, the, um, the body of literature for sudden death with anomalous arteries is generally in um, younger active people. Then I'll be going over the typical uh, or atypical clinical presentation of athletes and young people um, with anomalous coronaries. Um, <clears throat> then when we, uh, are presented with an anomalous coronary artery. I'll um, go over the initial evaluations and subsequent imaging. And finally, uh, after we have all this information, I'll be going over the current uh, belief and standard for how to exercise restrict these individuals um, and how to guide them through treatment and share decision-making for return to play. So first starting with two cases here. Um, this first case is a 19 year old male college soccer player he has exertional chest tightness that happens every time he reaches peak exertion. Um, it goes away very quickly though, the second he stops. Um, given these uh, concerning findings, he came to clinic. Uh, we performed a maximal exercise stress test on him. Once again, that's a stress test where he goes to exhaustion, not to target heart rate. Um, and, and he was found to have anterior ST depressions. So given this, there was a concern um, for coronary artery abnormalities. So we got a CCTA and uh, we found an anomalous left um, coronary off the right sinus of Valsalva with an interarterial course. <clears throat> so it's not his, um, as well as his parents, natural next questions were, number one, um, is there any intervention or any surgery needed? And number two, um, can he return to sports? And if he can return to sports, what's the safest way to do that? Next case, a little bit different, but also very common. Um, this is a 50 year old female recreational marathon runner. She had a CAC scan done as preventative care with her PMD. Um, this didn't show any significant CAC, but it did show suspicion for anomalous uh, right coronary off the left sinus of Alsalva. Now she is completely asymptomatic and running about 40 to 50 miles a week. But given this finding, uh, we did an exercise stress test on her and she had an excellent VO2 max as expected um, for an active woman of this age. And she had no symptoms and no ST changes um, with that scan. However, she did some reading and was still very concerned about her anomalous uh, right coronary artery. So her questions now are, is it okay to continue training or specifically is it okay to continue running um, 40 to 50 miles a week? And um, in addition to that, is it okay to continue racing? Um, and the main concern there is that she'll be reaching peak exertion uh, during these races. So to start with some nomenclature, just to uh, formalize things. Um, so coronaries are named, as we all know, based on the area that they um, supply of the heart um, downstream of the origin in that uh, no matter where we start, if the coronary supplies the RV free wall, that's considered the right coronary. If it supplies the anterior septum, it's considered the LAD. And if it supplies the LV free wall, that's considered the left cert. Now there is a um, dividing line between what we call an anomaly and a variant. Um, now this line is not, uh, it's not totally set, but looking at the general literature now, it's been kind of semi 
formally agreed upon that um, the 1% prevalence rate is what splits an anomaly from a variant in that if there is a prevalence of a specific anatomy over 1%, it's considered um, a variant, whereas if it's less than 1%, it's considered anomalous. Uh, the most common normal variants we see are a separate conus um, and a separate LAD and left circ. Once again, these are um, clinically uh, relatively in inconsequential and um, seen in uh, just over 1% of people. <clears throat> Here is a diagram of um, the, the course of an anomalous coronary. Um, now, here, when I refer to ALCA in the further um, talks, this will be an anomalous left that is supplying the um, ovary free wall as well as anterior septum um, coming off the right sinus of Alsalva. And then when I refer to anomalous right, that will be um, the coronary that supplies the RV free wall coming off the left sinus of Alsalva. And very rarely you can have um, coronaries coming off the non coronary cusp. Um, I won't be discussing that here. And I also won't be discussing um, alpaca or any other uh, rarer forms of anomalies. Now, um, <clears throat> with uh, anomalous origins, the proximal course of the artery can take multiple um, directions, specifically in relation to the great arteries as well as in relation to the septum. Um, and generally speaking, uh, what we really care about is the interarterial course, which is one of the more common um, courses, especially with an anomalous left. And that if the proximal course of the artery after splitting off from the coronary cusp goes in between the PA and the aorta, this is considered high risk. Whereas these other ones, generally speaking, in the absence of um, alarming anatomic findings are considered benign. So um, to cover some basic epidemiology, um, anomalous coronary, this anomalous origins of coronaries, uh, thought, to, thought to be uh, among the top causes of death among young individuals uh, with the divided line roughly at about 35 years of age in that those who die suddenly, especially with physical activity under the age of 35 are frequently found to have uh, anomalous coronaries um, and that's attributed as their cause of death. But once we get over 35, active or not, um, athlete or not, um, the overwhelming, the most common cause of death is routine coronary artery disease. Now, looking at large studies, uh, both non-invasive and invasive, of the prevalence of anomalous coronaries. Um, now, this has changed over time, given how, um, how our studies have picked this up. And now, it's frequently done with uh, non-invasive studies, whereas previously, before the year 2000 or so, most of the prevalence studies were done um, on incidental findings on coronary calf. But the prevalence is thought to be somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7% uh, overall. Now, pulling in autopsy data as well as these prevalence studies, um, <clears throat> it's found, it's been consistently found that anomalous rights are much more common than anomalous lefts, with an anomalous right um, prevalence of about 0.2%, whereas the anomalous uh, left prevalence is about 0.03%. Now, there are many, um, not many, but there are several uh, large cohort studies um, describing, um, describing prevalence as well as risk based on um, sudden death studies and pathology studies. Now, here is a more common one. I mean, not more common. Here's a more recent study just published two years ago. Um, this is out of a the group in the UK um, doing lots of research in the sports cardio cardiology area. Um, this one was published in Jack E.P. So in this study, um, they analyzed 5,100 cases of sudden cardiac death um, and found a prevalence of an anomalous coronary of 0.6%. Uh, once again, this is in line with that 0.3 to 0.7% that's commonly reported. Uh, the mean age of death is 28 years, um, relatively young, definitely under 35, consistent with prior literature as well. And interestingly here, um, in these studies, all of which had uh, cardiac pathology performed, there was subendocardial fibrosis in 37% of cases. Uh, which suggests that the, um, the anomalous artery was causing some chronic ischemia, or at least there was some chronic adverse remodeling in response to these abnormalities. Now, um, <clears throat> while the studies weren't prospectively done, so not clinical information wasn't available on all these subjects, it was reported that um, death occurred during exercise or just after exercise uh, in 50% of cases. And when we looked at all the rights versus the lefts, um, those with an anomalous left much more frequently died um, during exertion than those with an anomalous right. Um, now here is another study. Um, this is an American study 
that uh, most of our, uh, much of our understanding of the risk of coronary anomalies is based off of. Um, <clears throat> so here, this, this paper was published in 2009. Um, out of a multi-center study looking at sudden cardiac death in young competitive athletes over 26 years. So once again, this is a very large study. Um, and here they found, um, or they looked at 1,800 uh, sudden deaths, um, narrowed that down based on physician adjudication, based on uh, case records, and found that there were about 1,000 cardiovascular deaths. And of these, um, 600, 690 did not have, I mean, 690 had a confirmed cardiac event. And here we see the split of what uh, supposedly might have contributed to this cardiac, these cardiac events. Now there is some misalignment here in the paper, apologize for that. But here we find that the number one cause of sudden death um, was HCM. Um, now this data is a little bit unique in that HCM is so highly prevalent among sudden cardiac death um, cases. Um, but now this, uh, this study was generated from multiple um, HCM centers of excellence. So this might be overrepresented here. But the area of focus here is that the number two cause with 119 um, deaths out of 690 um, cardiac event deaths was uh, from a coronary anomaly. So here we see that coronary anomalies um, represent a very common cause of sudden death in young athletes. And specifically when you break that down, of those 119 deaths, 65 had an anomalous left, uh, whereas only 16 had an anomalous right. Uh, once again, confirming that the risk of sudden death from an anomalous left appears to be much higher than, than the risk of sudden death from an anomalous right. Here's another large study, um, probably the largest one. Now, once again, most of our um, guidelines and evidence uh, are based off of. This was published in Annals of Internal Medicine um, around the year 2000. And here, this is a large armed forces study where they somehow managed to get 6.3 million recruit data um, to base the study off of. Now, this is, this is an important study that is the first prospective study um, looking at sudden death among young people. And there's an extremely large denominator, as you can see, with those 6 million um, people. And all of these people, all these recruits, I should say, um, were engaged uh, in similar physical activity. And then they, they had um, eight weeks of intense physical training. They all had a similar environment and that they were all living in the same place. And every single death had an autopsy uh, including cardiac pathology performed. So while this is an observational study, um, it's almost like a self-contained experiment as well. And here, um, out of those 6.3 million recruits, um, now there were many more deaths than this 126 here, but many of them were traumatic. So if you look at the 126 non-traumatic deaths, 64 of them were attributed to cardiac cause. And um, <clears throat> of these 64 deaths, most of them were related to exercise. Specifically, e they either occurred during physical training um, or immediately afterwards. And of these 64, um, 21 were found to have an anomalous, anomalous coronary, um, whereas the other 40 something were um, non-coronary causes. But interestingly, of these anomalous arteries, every single one of these um, was an anomalous left off the right. And so the finding that among 6 million people undergoing new physical training, that there were no anomalous right deaths, uh, whereas there was 21 anomalous left deaths, shows that um, this anomalous left is the, is the true high-risk pathology when we have an abnormal origin. Now, moving on to some of, um, you know, based on a lot, a lot of those studies, the studies of those types, there are some commonly accepted um, facts um, about anomalous lefts and anomalous rights. First being that the anomalous right is much more common than anomalous left overall. And as I stated and showed in the previous studies, um, the anomalous left um, is frequently associated with cardiac death, um, much more so than the anomalous right. But how does that relate to physical activity? So this study here was performed out of Italy, published in Jack in the early 2000s. And here, um, Italian investigators um, looked at sudden death um, in athletes and sudden death in non-athletes. And specifically when looking at sudden death attributed to anomalous coronaries, um, they found that the risk of sudden death was 79 times higher um, than the risk of a sudden death from anomalous artery in non-athletes, which if you can extrapolate, um, the authors concluded that this is likely because <clears throat> the, of the frequent physical activity um, predisposing athletes 
to sudden death with anomalous arteries, whereas less frequent activity among non-athletes leads to um, less sudden death, even with the same coronary anomaly or pathology. Now, um, as I touched on earlier, in older athletes, and among all people actually, um, over 35 years old, um, CAD is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. And this is especially true um, among people who die during exercise. Now, there's a few causes of this. Um, <clears throat> now, it's not thought that those with the truly high risk anomalous left might have um, died or had an event before the age of 35. Um, therefore, this could represent some survivorship bias in that we see um, less anomalous coronary related death once you get over the age of 35 or so, or that there are really only low risk variants remaining, which might um, contribute to some of that, or the, might contribute to the consistent finding that the anomalous right is so much more frequently found than the anomalous left, despite the difference um, in cardiac risk and sudden death. Okay, so moving on to the next section of the talk here, I'll be talking about the pathophysiology um, that may contribute to sudden death um, with an anomalous origin of a coronary, coronary artery. So generally speaking, it's accepted that um, with an anomalous proximal course, this can lead to transient ischemia, which downstream can either lead to um, chronic ischemia and scarring, which can predispose to fatal arrhythmia, or just um, these moments of transient ischemia can predispose um, susceptible individuals to fatal arrhythmia and sudden death. Now, the traditional teaching um, decades ago, maybe years ago, was that uh, an artery running between the great artery, a coronary artery running between the aorta and the PA um, would be predisposed to compression, especially with activity, and that with activity, there's increased flow from the aorta and the PA, therefore compressing the artery and causing downstream ischemia and leading to sudden death. However, um, over the last few decades, um, IBIS studies and pathology studies have really made this um, the theory uh, a little bit obsolete, possibly debunked. Um, and with the current thought being that uh, anomalous arteries are actually mostly intramural, and the intramural course is, is what predisposes um, on the death, which I'll go over in the later slides. Um, now, like I say, if that proximal artery is intramural, you can think it's, so it's intramural within the aortic wall. And even with exercise, if PA pressures go up, now they shouldn't be enough to both overcome the resistance of the aortic wall or to overcome the um, diastolic pressure uh, leading to coronary filling. So the pressure isn't high enough to compress an, ar an artery, really shouldn't be high enough to cause significant ischemia and lead to sudden death um, down the road. So if it's not with this um, scissor-like compression, um, what exactly is the pathophysiology that leads to sudden death uh, in athletes or even non-athletes with uh, anomalous coronaries? Uh, one of the first thoughts is that, um, well, this is based out of investigators who study a lot of anomalous coronaries with IBIS. And they found pretty consistently, um, that especially with interarterial anomalous arteries, that the proximal um, section of these arteries is very hypoplastic. And then not only is it smaller, um, but the artery walls um, have less structure to them and are therefore prone to more compression. And with this compression, um, we can see here that there can be a slit leg orifice uh, with lateral compression. And of course, with this smaller area from this orifice, we have lower, um, lower flows through the artery and therefore potential ischemia downstream. And in addition to the compression itself, um, a long intramural course, um, especially as this whole course has a narrowed, um, narrow cross-sectional area. Now this long course can predispose to further ischemia or higher risk of ischemia as sudden death. And while this last point is a little bit controversial, um, some studies have shown that with exercise or with stress, this um, proximal intramural segment actually compresses further uh, as heart rate increases. But whatever the pathology here, um, <clears throat> the overwhelming, or I guess the overarching theme is that some proximal abnormality or multiple uh, proximal abnormalities um, lead to downstream ischemia and uh, fatal arrhythmia. Now this has been supported by autopsy studies uh, by some autopsy studies, I should say, which have uh, found high rates of downstream fibrosis in the area of the um, anomalous artery distribution. Uh, this is much more frequently found with anomalous left than anomalous rights. 
However, this has not been replicated by all studies. So it's a little bit of controversial, um, controversial finding here, but a common one. Now, there are some um, findings that go against, um, against this theory of proximal abnormality leading to um, downstream ischemia. Um, and the first is that um, with people who have died suddenly from a coronary artery uh, anomaly, um, of those who've undergone ECG stress testing beforehand, um, it's, it's been reported in multiple studies that these stress tests tend to be completely normal and not reveal any ischemia, um, despite a higher risk anomaly that actually led to death. Um, and other small case series of post-surgical uh, studies in which after these arteries have been fixed or, or repaired, um, stress testing is performed. Some small case series have shown that despite the correction of the anomalous artery, um, stress testing in the area of that artery is still abnormal, even after correction. Um, and authors here have um, speculated that there's some sort of chronic remodeling um, leading to fatal arrhythmia and death in addition um, to just that proximal abnormality. Yep. So here is an um, uh, invasive catheterization um, of an anomalous artery. Now here we see an anomalous left coming off the right coronary cusp. Um, and actually, from this one 2D image, um, looks pretty normal with a nice large caliber in the proximal section of that, of that artery. Um, now the benefit of uh, invasive evaluation is that we could perform uh, pharmacologic stress to get functional measurement in that some, investigate, some, some clinicians uh, would put a pressure wire down the anomalous artery and under stress, um, see what the FFR is. And if it drops, um, consider that a uh, ischemically significant artery and higher risk. However, you can see that there are some limitations with uh, routine angiography that we can't really define the stenosis, which tends to be uh, similar to an eccentric plaque and hard to characterize unless you get enough views. But with IVIS, um, we can see that this is a proximal section of this artery actually, and it's actually very, very narrow despite its um, normal angiographic appearance in this view. And when you go distal to that uh, intramural part, we see a more normal artery. This is consistent with that, um, or this is, should I say, led to some of the theories that is that proximal morphology um, that leads to ischemia downstream. Now on to clinical presentation of um, people with anomalous coronaries. Now, um, typically um, people with an anomalous artery, especially with higher risk, demonstrate exertional or anginal symptoms. Um, that is they either have angina, uh, palpitations or dizziness or lightheadedness, either during exertion, especially peak exertion or immediately after stopping exertion or having to stop because of these symptoms. Now that's traditional teaching and it may be present in many cases. But if we look at multiple studies here, we see that um, this is actually a very extremely insensitive um, finding for those with even the highest risk anomalies. So here, once again, from our um, Italian colleagues, as well as some American collaborators, uh, we have a paper here from 2000 um, detailing some of the uh, presenting symptoms for those um, who had an actual sudden cardiac death from the anomalous coronary. So here, um, investigators looked at 27 sudden death cases with an anomalous coronary and found that um, all of them actually died either during exercise or immediately after exercise, with 25 of them occurring during exercise and two upon immediate sensation. Now, once again, this study was a little bit confounded in that of all these sudden deaths, not every single one of them had um, seen physicians previously, but of these cases, um, many had, and of the ones that did uh, see a physician previously, um, only 10 of them actually reported previous symptoms. And among those 10, um, six of them actually had ECG stress tests, and every single one of those was normal, um, <clears throat> which demonstrates the concept that number one, uh, even with a high risk variant that can lead, that did lead to sudden death, most do not have symptoms. And even those who do have symptoms concerning um, for ischemia or an anomalous artery, all of them actually had normal ECG stress tests. Here's a, a more recent paper um, that really sheds a lot of light uh, on the clinical presentation of coronary anomalies. Um, this paper is published out of the group in Houston um, where they established a large coronary anomaly program 
uh, I believe between Texas Children's as well as all the other hospitals in the area. So they prospectively enrolled all coronary anomalies that were referred to them um, over a five-year period between 2012 and 2017. They then ended up um, getting 163 patients um, and consistent with prior data, most of these were anomalous rights, though there were anomalous lefts as well. And these were all younger patients as it was a, uh, as these patients came through a children's hospital and all of them were under 20 years old. And every single one of these um, patients who were referred, they had a known coronary, coronary anomaly, but they underwent um, more imaging and more risk stratification with standardized evaluation um, to further characterize risk here. So in addition to this evaluation, um, investigators here um, categorized variants as high risk or non-high risk based on the presence of ischemic symptoms, positive functional testing, um, or concerning anatomy, such as a narrowed, art, narrowed orifice or a long intramural course on CCTA. And here's the um, figure I pulled from that paper, looking at just the symptoms that they came, uh, or I guess that they were referred to the clinic, clinic for. And you see here that literally half the patients here were um, found to have an anomalous coronary as an incidental finding, and that they were completely asymptomatic. If you break down the symptoms further, we see the exertional symptoms, which are the ones that we expect to see um, with an anomalous artery, were only present in 21% of all these cases, um, whereas non-exertional symptoms were present in 20%. But the main finding here is that half of these patients um, have no symptoms from their anomalous artery. Now here they modeled um, multiple covariates to see which, um, what factors of presentation were associated with high risk findings, that is either ischemic symptoms, positive, positive functional testing, or concerning anatomy on subsequent CCTA. And it was found that long intramural course, as discussed before, was associated with high risk findings. And uh, specifically with symptoms, um, really the only symptom associated was um, syncope on exertion. Um, but this was a very high uh, odds ratio in that those with exertional syncope um, tend to be higher risk for possessing um, a high risk uh, anomalous coronary. Once again here, stressing that 50% are asymptomatic and only 20% have exertional symptoms with an anomalous artery. <clears throat> now I'm um, moving on to uh, further evaluation and workup um, once we suspect an anomalous coronary. Um, one of the easiest ways and most frequent um, ways that an anomalous origin is detected is um, through echocardiography. And um, <clears throat> studies have shown now that Generally speaking, in people with agreeable body habituses, um, echo can identify both coronary ostea in about 90% of cases. And then with the addition of color Doppler, um, we can help identify the proximal course and angle of takeoff to identify how, risk, how high risk the um, proximal anatomy is um, in an anomalous origin. However, this is limited um, by a lack of standardized protocols. And also, as you can imagine, um, you really need high, highly skilled sonographers to identify those arteries. Now, if we look at some of the um, athlete guidelines, um, while echo is not um, really in any guidelines considered a, a sufficient method to evaluate anomalous coronaries, um, the current JAK guidelines for athletes state that it is reasonable to identify the ostea uh, when undergoing echo for any other reason. Here are some examples of some pictures um, of coronary origins um, right next to uh, a picture of the CT in the same patient. So here, uh, the top figure, we see a normal right coronary and a normal left coronary. Um, typically, you don't get to see both in such a good picture like this, but you know, in this paper, we do see that. And then, um, now this is in um, short axis. Now in long axis, here we see a right coronary artery um, coming off but it's thought to be the appropriate cusp, um, though in long axis, we cannot quite differentiate uh, where we are compared to short axis. But here's what a right coronary looks like coming off the, the right coronary cusp. Now, how do we get these images? Um, so for the right coronary, it's um, the standard peristernal long axis shifted a little bit cranially. And then for the left coronary, if you clock the probe, about 30 degrees or so, um, you should be able to identify the left coronary ostea. Now here is a, an example of a rather ideal picture here um, in that the probe is on the chest, clock about 30 degrees, and here we identify um, the left coronary artery. You can see on echo 
the LED, the Ramus, and the, the star, the circ. And once again, um, this is a very ideal image. It's, um, you'd be pretty fortunate to find all arteries like this um, in a single view. Now here's looking at an anomalous right with echo. Um, so once again, um, personal short axis, tilt it up a little bit. We see here um, in short axis, you see the left, as well as what looks like possibly another artery coursing anteriorly from the left cusp. Now with addition of color, um, we can see that artery. So this looks like an anomalous right off the left. Now, once again, you are limited um, with regard to further evaluation of the of more distal artery, but you can definitely see an anomalous origin here. And here's an anomalous left. Um, <clears throat> so here, actually, it's not, not as clear, but you can see an LED coming off here and what looks like the possible um, intramural course. And with color, we do see that. And now without color, shift it a little bit. You can see that long intramural course of an anomalous right, anomalous left coming off the right. There's another picture of an anomalous right off the left. Um, it's a good clear picture here, and with addition of color to confirm it. Now moving on past echo, um, you really once the once I, once an anomalous artery is suspected or identified an echo, it should move to um, better imaging here. And so CCTA is now class one, is now class um, one testing to characterize and look for uh, anomalous coronaries. It's actually considered the gold standard in the first line as well. And the benefit of CCTA is we have rapid scan times, especially with um, advancing protocols and better machines. Um, now cost used to be somewhat of an issue, but this is lowering, um, especially now that centers are generally incorporating CCTA um, in CAD evaluation. And in addition to being able to find the arteries, you can really gain a lot of information, um, a lot of an anatomic information um, with, the, with that one simple image. We can identify proximal anatomy, especially um, how narrowed the artery is, how long the intramural course is. You can also see the distal course uh, to see how much of the myocardium that anomalous artery can supply or does supply. Now, there are some drawbacks, of course. Uh, the main one being the um, need for contrast and the use of um, radiation, which is a, a concern, especially in younger females. Uh, but with um, the newer CT scanners, as well as prospective gating, um, <clears throat> protocols have actually really reduced the radiation dose um, of a routine CCTA, and that has lowered that diagnostic, lower than most diagnostic caps. And actually, if you look at the National Cancer Institute's recommendation on using CT in young people, they state that for an individual child, the risk of CT um, are small and the individual benefits, um, risk benefit balance favors the benefit when used appropriately. So when we're suspecting an anomalous coronary in a young person, um, I would say that the um, tiny risks are outweighed by the benefits of identifying high risk variants um, in agreement um, with the NCI state. Now here are some examples of what we can see on CT. Um, looking at panel A, this is kind of a equivalent of a short axis um, image here. Um, we can see separate ostia here of an uh, anomalous right off the left, as well as the left. Here's a shared ostium, and you can also identify the uh, more distal, um, more distal uh, coronary anatomy in addition to just that proximal course. And when, when we see an anomaly, we can also identify the proximal vessel morphology. So here's flipping. Um, flip an image here. This is what a normal artery looks like, should be nice and round. Now with a little bit of ovoid section, you get some narrowing. And with even um, more compression, you can see a slip leg narrowing, which is a high risk feature um, with anomalous arteries. And in addition to being able to see um, what that initial uh, orifice looks like, you can walk down the artery all the way until you get to a more normal cross-sectional cross appearance or round artery. And there you can quantify how long that um, that uh, anatomic abnormality is. Here in this case, it's about 10 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> you can also identify whether or not the artery is intramural as seen here. You can identify the angle of takeoff and that acute angle takeoffs are considered higher risk and higher um, and more prone to ischemia. And then you can identify the takeoff level as well with some 3D reconstruction. Um, here are some other nice images of um, CT of some anomalous coronaries. Now here is a high risk uh, right off the left. We see it's got 
an acute angle of takeoff, as well as a very narrow um, initial cross section. Um, figure D is a uh, different anomaly, but here we have an anomalous left off the right with what we see is a, a benign uh, prepulmonic course. And this is a 3D reconstruction, um, which is good for overall imaging, especially when showing to patients. You can also use cardiac MRI, which also has a class one indication to um, analyze these arteries. Um, this is the benefit of, entire, of imaging the entire vessel course and identifying not only high risk features of the vessel, but can identify fibrosis um, or scar that might be a result of chronic ischemia from an anomalous artery. Benefit here is that there's no radiation. It can also use um, um, stress imaging for functional evaluation in addition to atomic, uh, anatomic evaluation at the same time. Limitations here are that the resolution is not as good as with CCTA. And um, one of the main limitations also is that um, this modality is not widely available everywhere, largely limited to large centers and academic centers. And there's long scan times, which can be a problem for especially claustrophobic younger people. And the costs are still quite high compared to CT. Here are some representative images of what MRI um, of anomalous coronaries looks like. Um, now it looks pretty similar to CT. Here we see a right off the left. Here's a right off the left as well. Um, here is a left off the right in figure B. And then the figure C here is another left off the right, but this has a benign course in that it is interceptal. Um, and lastly, um, invasive angiography, which is the prior standard for evaluating coronaries, um, it still has a role in evaluating uh, anomalous coronaries. And the main thing being um, that you can get invasive functional measurement um, with FFR. Um, and intracoronary imaging is actually the main reason to use this, and that IVIS and OCT are probably the best methods to evaluate um, how much stenosis and how long stenosis is in the proximal artery. Um, and of course, the, um, the quantification here is uh, better than CT and MRI, but um, you know, compared to those non-invasive findings, it's, uh, the risk is much higher, even though small. These risks are important, though, in that most of these are younger patients with no established disease. Um, so frequently, we choose the non-invasive method first. Um, but when the non-invasive method suggests something that we need to further uh, quantify risk, we can use um, invasive angiography, specifically IVIS and OCT, in that um, standard um, contrast images with invasive coronary angiography aren't sufficient um, and often have a difficulty identifying the course. Um, now, CT uh, and angiography have similar rates of radiation, um, with angiography possibly having a little bit more. And compared to MRI, of course, where there's no radiation, um, there's a difference there. So in general, um, invasive angiography should not be first line, but can definitely be an adjunct to risk stratifying um, abnormalities. Um, <clears throat> now here, uh, we see an angiogram here with, you see the nice right coronary here, and you can see the start of a left here too, suggesting uh, and an almost origin of the left. And here's the OCT images of a proximal uh, of the proximal segment of an anomalous left. Yeah, and we see a very slit-like orifice here, great resolution. Now I'll move on to the last part here of treatment. Um, what we should do once we find uh, these anomalous arteries in younger people and young athletes. Now believe it or not, in 2015 there are athlete-specific guidelines from the ACC AHA. Um, these should be updated soon, but currently. A lot of the guidelines are from this 2015 position paper. And there's a more recent um, guidelines from the ACC AHA with regard to management of congenital disease, including congenital coronary artery anomalies um, in overall in adults, not just athletes. So we kind of combine these two um, guidelines and positions to guide some of our care here. Um, one thing that both agree on is that with an anomalous coronary, anyone with any signs or symptoms of ischemia um, should be referred for surgical correction. Um, <clears throat> that's agreed on by the congenital guidelines as well. Now, keeping in mind, um, now I guess one thing to keep in mind with these, um, with these, this statement particularly, is that um, you know, even though it makes a lot of sense to refer anyone with ischemia to surgery, um, there are actually no hard prospective outcome studies um, as these would be very, very difficult to perform. But given that, um, especially an anomalous left is so high risk for sudden death, um, the cautious approach is to refer people um, for correction when there's concern for high risk uh, anomaly. And that's the approach that led to this recommendation. <clears throat> 
Now, um, briefly about surgical correction. Um, there are no large trials saying what the optimal surgical strategy is. Now, there are multiple methods to correct an anomalous artery. Um, there's unroofing, um, grafting, and reimplantation. Um, <clears throat> over the prior decades, uh, grafting and reimplantation were relatively common. But now, um, over the last 10, 20 years, unroofing has become the most common, at least in the United States. Um, and that is the simplest, and it corrects the intramural course, which is thought to be responsible for the high risk variants. Um, so briefly here, um, there's diagrams of surgical corrections. So here, A is an anomalous left off the right. And in figure B, we have a, um, a lima graft, grafting onto the anomalous artery with or without ligation of the proximal section. You can have a vein graft as well. This is not performed very commonly anymore. Um, figure F, or I guess part F, is um, coronary reimplantation in which in, in certain coronary anatomies, you can take out the coronary, the anomalous coronary or reimplant it, re it into the correct sinus. And figure G is unroofing here, which is in this next figure. So here we see an anomalous left off the right um, with a very small um, origin. And here the surgeons can um, open up the aorta, cut down to open up that um, intramural section and leave a long open section um, for a long ostia of the left. Um, this effectively corrects that um, the proximal narrowing in the anomalous left. And here's a post-surgical CT. We see that very large um, now corrected um, orifice of the left. Now going down some of the um, uh, treatment recommendation algorithms here, this is from the um, congenital guidelines. With the anomalous left, uh, it's pretty straightforward in that any ischemia should be referred for correction. And without ischemia, it should also be referred for correction. Um, now this is agreed on by the um, athlete guidelines, but there's some um, disagreement, I should say, with uh, left coronaries, anomalous lefts that do not show signs of ischemia or high-risk findings. And here, um, this is a table from kind of hidden um, in, the, in the congenital guidelines saying that continued observation actually may be reasonable in um, people, not athletes, people who have anomalous lefts without any um, high-risk findings or ischemia. Whereas the athlete guidelines suggest that anyone with an anomalous left, any athlete with an anomalous left um, should be corrected. Now, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, um, we agree with the athlete guidelines here and that these athletes are frequently pushing themselves um, to maximal exertion, uh, which may predispose themselves, may predispose to ischemia and uh, sudden death. So we are more in line with um, athlete guidelines showing that with an anomalous left, they should be referred to correction. Um, rather than continued observation as with non-athletic adults, which may be reasonable. Um, now with anomalous right, there's a little bit more wiggle room um, in that those with ischemia should go for surgery. Now those without ischemia or any inducible arrhythmias um, can go either way. And this is um, agreed on by both the congenital guidelines as well as athlete guidelines um, in that surgery can be recommended or watchful observation can be recommended with the lack of any high-risk findings or ischemia with an anomalous right. Now, um, some good language here in the athlete guidelines is that um, while you can quote, clear an athlete um, to continue sport participation with an anomalous right after it's been risk stratified, um, this should really only occur after uh, adequate counseling of the athlete and the parents, if it is minor, um, on the risk of this in that the risk is it's uncertain, and there's certainly an abnormality there, um, but the addition of a negative stress test or additional anatomic imaging can help guide the decision there. Which leads us to the concept of shared decision-making, um, which is really um, the new paradigm in cardiac care, not just with athletes. Um, now, 2008, anyone with any coronary anomaly um, used to be restricted uh, per the Bethesda guidelines in that they could not perform any competitive physical activities uh, if they had an uncorrected anomaly. Now, these newer guidelines I've been talking about a little more permissive, um, which leaves room for shared decision-making, especially um, with an anomalous right. Now, as I was saying, the risk of an anomalous right is unclear in that it's been associated with sudden death, um, but much less frequently than an anomalous right. And in, um, with the lack of any high-risk features, you know, it, it may be possible that um, the risk is the same as someone with a normal um, 
normal coronary origin. However, that's a statement that isn't backed up by evidence, though it appears to be supported by some of the observational studies. Now, depending on the patient and their family, um, you know, they could take different, uh, different routes or decisions with an anomalous right. Um, for example, some younger athletes uh, might think, oh, if I have this increased risk, even if it's small, I'm gonna retire early and just not risk potentially the rest of my life to continue sport participation. Um, others may need more information, which can help, um, which can be obtained with invasive imaging. And others say, well, if I got a low risk anatomy, I have a very promising future career ahead of me. I just like to return to play now. Um, another thing to take into account is how old the patient is at presentation. And that younger patients, especially teenage or younger, may experience some changes with that, um, with their cardiac structure um, and may need more frequent evaluation of an anomalous right. Whereas if you get a 50 year old with anomalous right, chances are it's low risk in that they've lived this long with it. Um, and then it's up to them whether or not, or not they want to keep exercising or whether or not they want to correct it. Once again, further anatomic characterization really helps with the, um, the risk calculus here. So a brief word on what to do with these people after you make um, a decision, after you and the patient make a decision with surgical correction. Um, the main thing being that after surgical correction, they should be um, allowed to recover with no sport activity for three months. And then after those three months, they should be exercise stress tested um, before they gradually return to play, keeping in mind they will be deconditioned. And assuming that there are no ischemic symptoms or concerning findings as they return to play, they can continue with sport. Now, if um, they are recommended for sport, if they're recommended for surgery, for example, with anomalous left or a high-risk anomalous right, um, they sh should be restricted to class 1A sports, which are um, what we can think of as the very non-highly exertional ones, such as um, golf and bowling. And here is a um, flow chart kind of summarizing uh, what we just talked about, and that history and risk stratification are important um, to characterize these anomalies. And there's a high risk finding, um, they should be referred for surgery. Uh, if there's no high risk findings uh, with shared decision making, they can either be referred to surgery or continue sport eligibility. And then after surgery and a three month uh, monitoring period, they can be returned to play. Um, they should, of course, be um, frequently followed up to ensure that no complications arise. So, following up here on our cases that I presented at the beginning, what happened to the young soccer player with a very high risk? Uh, findings. Um, well, given his anomalous left, as well as the high-risk findings, he was referred for surgical correction. Um, he was restricted from play until that happened, but eventually, after three months, um, three months recovery from his surgery, he returned to play without any incidents, without any problems. And how about our um, master's female marathon runner? Um, <clears throat> now, she has a, as we talked about, a very low-risk anomaly in that it's anomalous right with no, um, no findings functionally or anatomically that are overly concerning. So is it okay to continue running for her? Answer is probably yes. She may have some increased risk or she may not, um, but it shouldn't be prohibitive where we will dictate that she can no longer run. Now, is it okay for her to continue marathon training? Well, shared decision-making, the answer is yes. She can probably continue, continue marathon racing and training. However, um, she decided the risk probably wasn't worth it um, to continue racing. So she was gonna continue running. Um, but stop, stop the racing, and we would have supported the decision either way. So key points here, um, just summarizing everything I talked about, is that anomalous coronaries are a main cause of death, sudden death in athletes, especially younger athletes. Um, the overall prevalence of an anomalous right is much higher than anomalous left, but the risk of an anomalous left is much higher than an anomalous right. CCTA um, should be the go-to test in most patients, um, though of course MRI is available and echo is how it's frequently picked up almost incidentally. Um, this should also be followed by functional testing uh, with stress testing to gauge whether or not ischemia is present. And in those where there's great concern, um, invasive functional testing um, can be pursued. Lastly, with regard to management, an anomalous left in an athlete um, requires surgical correction before returning to play. Whereas an anomalous right without high risk findings um, can really go either way after discussion with the athlete. Keep in mind that all these guidelines are based on observational data and we're really lacking um, prospective clinical study data.
Um, so that concludes my talk here. I have to thank a few people. Um, Dr. Williams, of course, for running the whole fellowship program, especially during these difficult times, uh, year two of difficult times. Um, Dr. Morrison Dickert, um, post, I, mean, I guess, current and previous program director for the clinical investigator track, um, which I was part of. And so I'll forever be grateful for them for taking me. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Kim, who served as my research mentor for the first two years. Uh, but not only was he a research mentor, he actually uh, let me follow him around a clinic for two years. So I really got some great clinical exposure and training to him and um, from him. And um, our work continues now. So with that, um, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you, Jason. Very good uh, review of a very interesting topic. Um, I guess I have a quick comment and then a, a question, and then we have some a couple questions from the audience that have been submitted, including one rather long <laughs> question from Dr. Fernandez. Um, but um, the uh, I guess a comment is I think everyone out there listening to this, particularly the fellows, I think this is uh, an entity anomalous coronary arteries that we're all going to need to gain some familiarity with managing because I think as we, we enter a world where um, coronary CT becomes more and more of a prevalent uh, means of, of evaluating patients with chest pain uh, and maybe myocardial perfusion imaging becomes less and less of a prevalent as time goes on, uh, means of evaluating patients, that we're going to have more and more of these patients, many of them picked up incidentally, uh, that end up in our clinics and knowing how to sort of counsel and manage these patients, I think is going to be important. Um, that being said, you talked you mentioned you talked a good bit about functional testing. I know I'm sure you and Dr. Kim um, use a lot of uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, particularly for your athletic patients. Uh, you know, maybe for a non-athlete, you know, say we you know have a, a 65 year old woman who's not an athlete who incidentally is noted to have uh, uh, an anomalous left coronary. You know, in terms of functional testing, what would you recommend? Would you recommend just Standard exercise testing, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, myocardial perfusion imaging. What what would be your thoughts in terms of functional testing for that particular patient? I mean, definitely, um, definitely exercise testing. Um, then we can gain some symptomatology as well as um, EKG changes of ischemia. Probably would also get perfusion imaging um, on that person. Now, um, you know, with um, with these older non-athletic patients, there's there's a little bit of a little more wiggle room in that they're not reaching, they're probably not reaching these levels of ischemia um, as frequently. Um, but for risk stratification, I think it would be helpful, um, especially with the anomalous left. Jason, I don't know if you can see the look at the chat. So Dr. Lind Steve Linderman uh, asked the first question about sort of, do we have a sense of the absolute risk of sudden death in these patients, both the lefts and the rights? He then had a follow-up, little back of the envelope calculations where uh, absolute risk of sudden cardiac death in, in anomalous lefts was maybe 3% in change and, and rights was much lower. Uh, does that match? Is that, are these, is this sort of data known or do we really have a sense, you know, in terms of the overall population, not just a military population or an athletic population, what this risk is? Yeah. So those, um, so these, um, these numbers have been run really only in back of the envelope fashion. And these numbers are pretty similar, um, what Dr. Linderman has shown here, has, has um, calculated here. Um, but, you know, we're never really going to get that information accurately because we're, we're never going to, or maybe we will, but we probably won't ever have a large database following these anomalous arteries and letting them go uncorrected for however many decades to see what the true prevalence of sudden death is. But um, I think this is as good as we're going to get. Yeah, and just as a reference point, you know, risk of sudden cardiac death and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies maybe somewhat less than, you know, maybe between a half a percent and 1% per year for all comers. So sort of just to get an idea. So it seems maybe anomalous left, maybe somewhat higher, possibly even higher risk uh, than somewhat higher risk than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and anomalous right, good bit lower. All right. And then Marcelo, uh, oh, geez. Um, you, you and Marcelo, maybe, uh, why don't we open it up to the audience, see if there's any other audience questions and maybe you and Marcelo can have a dialogue. Yes. Uh, uh, about his question. Sorry, Marcelo. Any, any other audience questions? 
Robbie, this is this is Jonathan here. Uh, I just had a quick comment. So first, great job as always, uh, Jason. That was a wonderful summary. Um, going back to your point, Robbie, I mean, one of the things to always remember is that uh, anomalous lefts um, off the right coronary centers are, are really rare. And so um, and to your point, which I think is a really good one about the use of coronary CT, I mean, what I think a lot of people, most people are going to run into, or you're not really probably, the likelihood of catching anomalous left off the right is pretty low. You're definitely going to pick up anomalous rights. Um, uh, anomalous lefts off or right are 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 rare. Right, uh, a right off the left, you're going to get a ton of. I mean, we picked up a few on our own. We've had referrals for coronary calciums done on um, masters athletes, and they have the anomalous rights. And so those are, I mean, obviously the challenging ones, particularly with the uh, the prevalence data uh, that um, that Steve put up here in the comment. Um, again, it, they're 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 fairly common, but the um, concern for the risk of sudden death are you know, actually really not that high. And so I would even submit like with, when you're dealing with athletes, particularly, I mean, that's the challenge of course, is you're dealing with individuals that are pushing themselves quite hard. And so we look at some of these kind of potential risk factors anatomically, but, but even with those, um, it, you know, I'm always, challenged by when we get functional tests and they're normal, you're not exercising these individuals. So stress CMR is a wonderful tool and certainly is very helpful whenever you see abnormal perfusion and then you, know, you feel more comfortable sending that athlete off to surgery. But more often than not, you know, you're just not gonna see ischemia and you're just not quite sure. So um, yeah, I mean, these are really tough cases. You know, whenever you go through the shared pro process, I am certainly more on the side of doing, of not referring these individuals to surgery, and I'm just just not convinced that um, uh, that in general, unless they're really giving you a story that's concerning that um, that they that they require uh, surgery, and you can typically follow these individuals and just kind of routinely, you know, proceed with clinical surveillance, et cetera. Um, but it's a big surgery, um, and you know, we actually had a recent uh, patient here. It's quite interesting. It was a young woman athlete who had a known anomalous right off the left for years uh, and was fine. Um, and she was followed by her pediatric cardiologist, stress tests every year, ETTs, which as Jason mentioned, is really not the best way to kind of completely reassure yourself. Um, and then she had a syncopal event. And this was confounded by the fact that she also had COVID. So she um, was recovered from COVID, so we kind of had to go through the concern of myocarditis. Um, and finally, she had more dedicated CT imaging, and she had a really concerning uh, intramural proximal right, uh, anomalous right-sided course. And uh, so we sent her for surgery, but this is all in the setting of ultimately having symptoms. So I think that really, in the end, it, it, I think it goes back to the clinical history is really the most important thing. Jonathan, um, this is Mon. And Jason, that was a really good job. Uh, you know, if you want to start an argument amongst our congenital colleagues and myself and everyone else, you know, just discuss right off the left. Right off the left is very controversial. Um, and uh, because it's, there are no clear data as was nicely illustrated. However, um, as Jonathan points out, a proximal intramural course to me is worrisome with any symptoms. And if I have an intramural course, my threshold for referral is a, lot, uh, is a lot lower. The other point is um, I've not seen a publication on this, but my experience has been that there's a strong correlation between um, right off the left of intramural course and myocardial bridging. In fact, I've had several patients get two forms of bridging or uh, 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 unroofing surgery in the same time, unroofing the proximal intramural segment and unroofing the, uh, the intra, intramyocardial segment. So I've seen this uh, several times and you know, I don't have, I've not been organized enough to put together a series, but this is, this is something that anytime I see a right off the left, I'll ask the radiologist or the cardiology, uh, the cardiology imager to look carefully to make sure there's no, there's no uh, intramural segment uh, or uh, intramyocardial bridging segment. And more often than not, there is. So I wonder if spasm has something to do with the pathophysiology. So uh, one thing that I've done for those patients is, is when I'm not convinced about symptoms, 
is uh, empirically at a very low dose to non-load of PD. Now, again, this is purely anecdotal. You take it with a grain of salt, but um, I did want to share that uh, nugget of experience when it comes to dealing with uh, these complex patients. I'll throw in one other point, just uh, as it, because again, probably most uh, most of you guys are not going to be seeing kind of 18, 19 year old athletes where um, you know these folks are referred in. Uh, maybe more likely it'll be kind of an older individual. Again, I think that calcium score story, that anecdote is actually fairly common where, oh, by the way, they've got this anomalous right. There is 60 some year old marathon runner. Um, and I think that also comes into play in terms of that shared risk discussion as it relates to how old they've been, how many years they've been an athlete. And these are asymptomatically picked up cases. And, you know, again, I, I think looking at some of these high risk findings certainly are a part of the equation, but you also have to kind of put that into context with the, with the athlete that you're seeing, how old they are, what their history is in terms of trying to figure out what's ultimately uh, the best uh, case, you know, course of management. I guess what I'm trying to say is just because they have these high risk findings and they've got an anomalous right off the lab doesn't necessarily mean that you got to whisk them off the surgery. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the sake of time. I think we'll adjourn here again. Great job, Jason. Thank you thank again you. for the review. Um, uh, and thank you to everyone for tuning in and uh, we'll see everybody next Friday morning. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.